Now I wanna go ahead and turn the program over to Ashley Kistler. Ashley is a member of the board of the Friends of VCU Libraries and a graduate of the BCU of our VCU School of the Arts. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks so much, Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Um, and uh, good morning to all of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome food justice activist Duran Chavez this morning. Since he founded Happily Natural Day in 2003, while working at the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia, Duran has expanded this annual celebration of Black culture through a year-round focus on urban agriculture and food sustainability. <clears throat> the growing network of community gardens he initiated in 2012 now serves communities of color across the city, many of which are located in what the USDA has deemed food deserts. His tireless commitment to increasing access to healthy, affordable food where it, where it is needed most rests not only on his passionate vision, but also on his willingness to coordinate the tough work of building hundreds of raised garden beds, for example, and delivering them to sites across the region. <clears throat> Duran's extraordinary example is something we should all honor and take to heart. Unlike the many community gardens he has helped launch over the past eight years, his recently completed resiliency garden is instead situated at what is arguably the most, at what is arguably the busiest intersection in Richmond. Duran and his team have transformed a sterile asphalt lot adjacent to VCU's Institute for Contemporary Art into a place that connotes reclamation, possibility, growth, and self-determination, demarcated by Richmond artist Silly Genius's mural, Black Space Matters. Duran's project goes straight to the thematic core of the ICA's exhibition, Commonwealth, of which it is part. This partnership has been mutually reinforcing. I think it promotes the like-minded convictions of both his food justice initiatives and the Institute's socially engaged programming. So many thanks to you, Duran, and Thank also you. to the ICA for creating this opportunity for public dialogue around a fundamental issue that brings into sharp relief one of the most tragic consequences of an inequitable system. Duran? Yes, that was an amazing introduction, Ashley. Will. Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I came up with, uh, you know, a couple of slides, uh, today, and I'm just going to kind of tell a story of what the last eight months have been like. Um, this has been, I'm sure for everybody, a wild ride, um, into the unknown, um, the world of WTF with the Rona and Trumpism and rebellions, the wild wild, crazy, crazy uh, jambalaya. But um, the presentation today is really just gonna kind of help you understand what all this stuff has been about. So um, I know we said we're gonna be talking about the impact of urban farming, um, but I think, you know, we talk about data and stuff like that. I think I'm gonna really just focus on, the per on my own personal narrative today and talk about what uh, has been happening and how we came up with this resiliency garden stuff. So um, thank you for, again, for the introduction. Um, I think uh, what will be pertinent is just kind of like explaining how in the world did we get here? Um, Happily National Day, uh, you know, of course, we started that back in 2003, as Ashley said, while we're at the Black History Museum. But my story um, of how we got to that, urban agriculture, that's a piece of the puzzle that a lot of people don't understand. Um, by virtue of doing this festival every year, um, we were blessed to get connected with all types of uh, Black people, from activists to healers, to musicians, to uh, spiritual leaders, uh, to craftsmen, uh, you know, and then most importantly, uh, and for the sake of this conversation, black farmers, 
uh, one of the most uh, impactful uh, relationships in the early stages of the Happily Natural Day was our connection to African American farmers uh, within the Richmond region. Um, one in particular, uh, Renard Turner from Vanguard Ranch uh, was a frequent vendor at Happily Natural Day. He would come bring his uh, produce for sale to the festival. You know, he had a, a food truck where he sold goats, uh, goat meat and everything. Uh, and it just turned into this uh, longitudinal relationship where he was from a vendor turned into a presenter. And, you know, we would talk a lot on the phone. And in my early age, I mean, I was like 22, 23 at the time, we'd be talking about things like food security, which um, for the sake of the conversation is just what is the availability of food for people, um, irregardless of their economic conditions, but just period, like, do you have food available? And one of the conversations that we would have is, you know, what would you do if the grocery stores closed? And, you know, at that time, I was a young father. I think my son was probably like three or four when we were having a conversation. It's a little alarmist uh, for, for me. It was, it was a lot for me to try to process. But um, it, came, it became evident that even in my own uh, activism work, you know, talking about holistic health and wellness, we weren't really dealing with some of the root causes of why people were unhealthy. Uh, in community, um, and particularly talking about where food comes from and whether food was actually available in the communities that we were uh, targeting. So um, around 2008, we started doing uh, pop-up farmer's markets. Uh, the Richmond Noir Market was a uh, modified farmer's market where we would connect an African-American farmer specifically to an area that did not have um, access to healthy food. And we would sell produce uh, through SNAP. Um, you know, at the time I was working at the, uh, at, um, the uh, uh, social services, I was a benefit program specialist. So I was the guy that would interview you if you wanted to get food stamps. So I'm promoting this uh, farmer's market program, uh, 20 pounds of produce for $20 while at social services trying to connect people who are on SNAP to healthy food in areas that have been formerly redlined, et cetera. We did that program from 2008 to 2016, every summer. So for uh, probably about four months, three months, 12 weeks, every Saturday, I'd be sitting with this farmer talking about, you know, when it is you need to plant, um, why is it that people grow uh, uh, roses instead of peppers in their front yard? Why are we growing grass when people are hungry? Conversations about his Vietnam experience. I mean, this is an elder, an older man. He's like my grandfather's age. And I started to feel guilty because here I am, you know, 27, 28 years old, um, and I'm selling produce. I'm like the third party aggregator. And here's this, el this elder statesman and I'm thinking to myself, well, if something happens to him, how in the world are we going to keep this program going? So long, long story short, in 2012, we started our first community garden, which um, you know, was McDonough Community Garden. And from there, it was like lightning struck for me as an activist. It was a transformation from this rhetorical conversation about health and wellness, you know, really talking at people about how they need to be healthier and eat healthier, to a tangible, practical, you know, transformation of the built environment that would provide space for people to increase and cultivate their agency around eating health. Uh, it was totally uh, a, a shift from, you know, a theory, a theoretical type of work around, you know, community change to a practice, like a literal, this is what, this is where you can get your hands dirty. And, um, it's been an amazing ride from, from there. We still do the festival and been, have been doing the festival and the inspirations along the way have been connecting with people all across the country who do urban ag. Um, for a while, we did Happily Natural Day in Atlanta and big influence by the brothers and sisters who do um, work around food justice and uh, the deep south. 
all of that work is informing uh, what we're doing or what we have been doing. Um, so a lot of you might be familiar with the work uh, that we've been doing because of you know, our experience at uh, Lewis Ginner Botanical Garden. Um, my story before working at Lewis Ginner, of course, I did nonprofit work we were in New Richmond. I worked as the project director for uh, Virginia State University's indoor farm, the Hardin Street Urban Ag Center. Uh, but in 2014, I took a job at um, Lewis Ginner as community engagement manager. Uh, it was a uh, really amazing experience because I was handed uh, a collaborative for collective impact called Beautiful RVA. Be out of Beautiful RVA was really uh, this uh, platform designed to promote uh, the development and, and implementation of uh, uh, public green spaces throughout the Richmond region for all the myriad benefits that come along with that, whether it's you know the social benefits of people being able to come together, social cohesion, to um, the health benefits, you know, addressing the urban heat island effect, of course, you know, food access, to even just the therapeutic nature of having green spaces and just the how and just the ways in which you know being close to green uh, uh, spaces can reduce cortisol levels and you know, uh, uh, help mitigate stress for, uh, for communities. And we know that there's a disproportionate, there's a disparity in between, you know, communities that are low income or uh, communities of color uh, and having actual green spaces that are actively maintained. So our work was really in that space uh, to figure out methods to build community capacity to uh, develop and sustain that, those, uh, sustain those green spaces. So we had um, a, our main program, our main arm of Beautiful RVA. Of course, again, this is a collaborative with myriads of uh, partners from uh, all across different sectors in the city from municipal organizations, i.e. the city of Richmond, to philanthropy, to nonprofits, for-profits, all these different organizations coming together to figure out methods that they uh, can, can, can create collective impact. Um, but our main laser focus was uh, the development of community uh, capacity through the Ginter Urban Gardener Program. And uh, this training program uh, that we did uh, was really designed to uh, invest not only in individuals and community, but also to invest in those communities that those residents were from. So we're not only, we were not only training people on how to develop green space, we were also providing the resources to actually implement those green spaces. And I think uh, one of the really resonant aspects of the training is that our focus uh, was really so solid and squarely uh, pivoted around this idea of community trust building and how you need to build uh, trust in community before, you know, developing or trying to, you know, put in this community garden or plant these trees. It's not enough to just show up with this stuff. It's like you have to really figure out how do you build this, the, 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 the community relationship that can sustain those spaces beyond, you know, the actual installation. So um, here in the, uh, on the slide, you see, you know, us in our most, the last class that we had, uh, which was in um, uh, March of 2020. And, uh, you know, here's also some other images of some of the spaces that have been developed. Um, but this is kind of where uh, things got crazy. So, and so, you know, every, we would do this training program twice a year. And, and you know, 2019, yes. Am Your I going screen up? is not shared. Oh, it's not. Hold on. Hold on. There we go. Let's see. Hold on. Sorry about that. It happens. All right. Let's see if I can get that back again. Uh, all right. Can you guys see my screen now? All right. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. So, um, 
So yeah, so what happens is that in 2020, you know, uh, we, we're gearing up to do the training. You know, our energy is focused. You know, we got all of our recruitments done and, you know, we launched our class in March, early March. Um, and what happens is uh, COVID-19 pops off, <laughs> right? Which is just totally... For everybody, I think just the state of emergency that occurs, um, we quickly try to figure out, okay, well, what are we doing? Like, how do we deliver this program in light of the fact that COVID is happening? And, you know, we don't know whether or not, you know, it's okay for us to meet. You know, we got this class of like 18 people. You know, can we, how do we deliver this training program in the face of the fact that, you know, this is a communicable disease that, you know, you got to stay six feet apart. It was just our first, our, our, our immediate thought was like, okay, well, that's, this means that we can't hold the class, right? This is a 16 week course. There's no way that we can implement this with these uh, uh, restrictions uh, that, that, that are out here. So what we decided to do was take the classes online and um, you know, start doing virtual sessions. I mean, this is like almost two weeks after the governor announces, you know, the stay-at-home order. We're like, all right, boom, well, we're going to do classes online, and we're just going to figure out, you know, how we do our hands-on stuff uh, in the community. So, uh, in the midst of all of this, you know, Lewis Ginner as an organization is trying to figure out how it's going to move forward with the fact that the government shut down. I mean, well, there's these stay at home orders. So, you know, I'm, I'm not only in community, still volunteering, still developing spaces and still working at spaces in a socially distanced manner and then doing these online virtual classes. Um, I'm also on calls on a weekly basis dealing with, you know, the garden and trying to figure out what was happening and blah, blah, blah. And in the back of my mind, I was like, somebody's about to get laid off. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not funny. It, well, it's, it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. Uh, just knowing that this is looming in the air, that eventually, you know, somebody ain't going to have a job. So um, I'll never forget. Uh, we, uh, I was on the call. This was like March 28th or something like that, the last week of March. And um, I'm on a call, the director's call, and I'm, uh, they're talking about, well, you know, they're going to have to do some layoffs. And I'm like, y'all need to let people know now, like ASAP what's going on, because people are, you know, going to have to make accommodations. They're going to have to figure out what they're doing. You know, this is, these are people, this is people's lives. And um, <laughs> two days later, I got the call to say, hey, man, Deron, we're going to have to let you go. <laughs> and so, um, I was, you know, I was, I was on the phone like, yo, and it was funny because I was actually at a green space, like, you know, doing work and there was people there, you know, filming us and stuff like that uh, about our COVID response. And so I get this call that's like, yeah, you know, you know, I had to let you go uh, or redu reduce you in force or what have you. And um, it was like, we're going to have to let you go next week. <laughs> so it was like, holy shit. Uh, so, well, okay, what are we doing? So in the midst of all this, right, this transition of jobs and stuff like that, um, we had already made the decision that instead of developing a green space uh, through uh, the, the training program, we would shift and start delivering raised beds to community members because I, we knew that what was going to happen as a result of this government shutdown and COVID was that A, people were gonna be even more food insecure because folks were gonna be losing their job, right? So that meant that people were gonna be struggling to try to buy groceries. And on top of that, we knew that, you know, the food system was gonna be challenged, which it showed and proved itself to be because when you went to the grocery stores, like only get two packs of chicken, right? Or two, 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 uh, packs of beef or what have you as you try to make your groceries. So we saw, you know, these outbreaks at uh, Tyson's Chicken, for example, where frontline people that are working in those factories were literally getting 
you know, outbreaks and having to stay at home. So that was affecting whether food was available in the grocery store. And then, you know, people actually going to the grocery store was a challenge because some folks are immunocompromised. So how do you go make groceries with the Rona and you have an immunodeficiency and you, you know, you're trying to stay six feet away from people when, you know, you got to make a transaction. So all of this, we're like, all right, boom. What we're going to do is we're going to take the funds that we were going to use to develop a green space and we'll take those that funding and purchase the materials to uh, uh, build raised beds for people at their homes. Like instead of getting people to come to a green space in their neighborhood, we're going to bring the green space to their to their neighborhood, to their house, to their, as, as close as possible to them. So, uh, you know, we had made that decision before I got laid off. <laughs> and so for me, uh, when I got the call, it was, uh, they didn't have a job anymore. I was like, well, I have, I have one of two decisions. I can either put all this stuff down and not do anything, or we can flip and continue doing the work, even though, you know, I'm no longer employed by the garden. And so my immediate decision, considering that the work that I feel like I do is bigger than anybody that I might work for. I was like, boom, we're going to keep this going. We're just going to flip it, right? And so instead of um, uh, raising money uh, through uh, Beautiful RVA, we took and started raising money through our fiscal, through, uh, through one of our collaborations and, you know, raised money through McDonough Community Garden and Richmond Foundation and just kept the ball rolling. So on, um, this is where it gets interesting. And I'm gonna try to speed this up because I know we only got a short amount of time. Um, so what happens immediately after I get told I'm laid off is that two days later, um, I, April 8th was my last day. So the Friday before April 8th, uh, my email, my phone stops working. I'm locked out of the Beautiful RVA website and the Beautiful RVA website shows up on that uh, Friday morning with this message saying that for the safety of all beautiful RBA getting urban gardeners are spending all activities in compliance with the government, which was totally news to me. <laughs> I was like, yo, that's not what I said we was gonna do, but okay. You know, so the so I got locked out of the beautiful RBA website, you know, locked out of my, uh, my emails, purchase orders that we had uh, put through for the program, for the uh, resiliency garden program got canceled. It was wild. So we say, all right, boom. So that means that, that Lewis Ginner is definitely not going to be an ally in his work as we go forward. Um, but that didn't, one monkey don't stop no show. Um, in between April and August of 2020, through a system of socially distanced volunteerism using Google Docs, um, uh, Google spreadsheets and um, project management software on our phones, we were able to marshal over 165 volunteers throughout the Richmond region and deliver not only wood and soil, but actually build uh, over 300 raised beds throughout the Richmond region. Um, and this also included plants, seeds, uh, you know, just really amazing kind of coming together of, of, of people from all backgrounds all across the city um, where we uh, move this stuff through. So what happens in May? Oh, oh, actually this is a this is an image of the Google Maps of all the places that we dropped up. I'll tell you, I had never driven past Goochland. I was all the way out in Monticello delivering raised beds to community members. Uh, folks going down to Petersburg, Virginia. We we're getting calls from Surrey County, Hampton Roads, people asking us to come up to Fredericksburg and deliver boxes. We had to be like, yo, you know, we only can go out 30, 30 mile radius uh, from, from Richmond to at, at some point, just kind of like let people know, hey, we don't have the capacity. But we were getting requests and we still have a queue of probably another 200 people that have requested, but we had to put it down you know, for the fall and winter so we could recap and come back in the spring. So, you know, I'd say I'd like to say, uh, all of this is going on 
And then boom, Richmond explodes. And here's an image of, you know, the, the burnt out bus. I think y'all folks might remember uh, in May of 2020 when um, uh, downtown Richmond explodes due to the George Floyd uh, 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 rebellion, right? And so this is directly across the street from the ICA, <laughs> which is which brings us to the story of uh, uh, the work around the resiliency garden. And so the entire time we've been doing this work, people have been paying attention. I guess people are watching. And we had already had a relationship with the Institute of Contemporary Art. I had done several uh, talk presentations with them last summer around the built environment, especially around food justice and um, you know climate justice. And they reached out. And we're like, hey, you know, can we collaborate on the closing of our Commonwealth exhibit? And their offer, or what the, the what was put on the table, was that you know there's this vacant asphalt parking lot right beside the ICA, and you know, do you want to put a resiliency garden in? And it was like. Yes, <laughs> of course. Why not? <laughs> this is going to be an amazing uh, way to kind of bring uh, uh, light to this to, to this conversation. And so, what we do is we take uh, this ninety by ninety uh, space, and in collaboration with Killing and Riano of Design Agency, this is an amazing architect, visual placemaker who um, we come up with this idea for a socially distanced garden space where we put in a grid, you know, um, and then we put in this mural. Uh, um, and, uh, and, 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 and then I, it's important for me to segue right at this point because the idea of the mural was a direct response to this idea of Black Lives Matter. Um, as we saw in Richmond, you know, the 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 taking over of you know uh, uh, the Robert E. Lee statue space, uh, it, it transformation into the Marcus Davis Peters uh, circle, you know, this idea of black space matters is kind of was a was a correlation uh, and an extension of this idea of Black Lives Matter as people you know around the uh, country. Uh, address these issues of police violence, um, it became important, it, it became clear to me that one of the main things that we weren't talking about was the need for people of color to have space that they can actually exist in and be without uh, fear of repression, without fear of uh, condensation, without fear of racial experiences. You know, these, we also saw during this period of time, you know, barbecue Beckys and, you know, the uh, uh, permit patties and you know all of these in incidences where white people were engaging black people in, this, in, in 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 public spaces or in their communities as if they did not belong there, right? And so um, we decided that we would you know take that idea of black space matters and and really focus it in on this particular space at the corner of Rod and Belvedere and uh, transform it into a resiliency guard. So what we end up uh, doing is in collaboration with um, uh, uh, Groundworks RVA um, and the BC School of Sustainability, uh, we end up putting in over uh, 30 raised beds, uh, over 20 uh, fruit trees, um, shade structure, um, man, it's got to be like at least 50 bales of hay um, that we're growing food in to demonstrate the different methods that folks in community can iterate uh, food access and food justice for themselves, accessible methods, not something that you got to have like, you know, hundreds of dollars to do, but just, you know, these are techniques. I mean, gr growing food in burlap bags, right? Um, taking a bale of hay and conditioning it and then being able to plant inside of that, right? Um, containers that you can utilize to grow fruit trees in your community, all those types of things were important. And so um, not only, you know, to highlight the food justice component, but also this is a black top, right? So this is also a perfect example to highlight the urban heat island effect 
that ex that communities of color experience throughout the city of Richmond as a result of redlining. We know that communities that were formerly redlined have uh, disproportionate amounts of impervious surface, which means that it's more concrete and asphalt in communities that were formerly redlined. And as a result, those communities are actually hotter than other neighborhoods and they lack tree canopy, right? So using this space, you can actually, you know, see what can be done in those communities in terms of developing green space on top of blacktop, right? So, you know, you ain't got to pull all the asphalt up, you know, you could just put something on top of it that, that could be resonant for communities. And, um, you know, when you look, when you take a look at the garden, at the, at the space from the aerial view, uh, that's when you really can see, you know, what uh, what 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 is what is being spoken to in terms of the mural. And we work with Silly Jeans to put to put this down. You know, the idea of space. You know, every square in there is four by six. So as, if you're in that space, it's already defined how or where you should be standing in order to engage with other people. You know what I mean? It's like the space creates this chamber where you can actually engage um, without uh, worries about the social distance. Uh, like, you know, there's actually a map that you can use like a guide. Every raised bed is four feet by six feet. So if I'm out here working and volunteering in this space, I know six feet apart is every box, right? So just kind of like trying to be uh, uh, utility, functional with the space, but also you know, uh, the form of the space is also is also impactful and, 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 and useful uh, for community. Um, we put in a shade structure. Um, you can't probably see it now, but on the side here, um, on these two, we put two banners up. One, of course, for happening National Day, but the second uh, was a quote by Kwame Ture, which says that the job of the conscious is to make the unconscious conscious. And, and that's a shortened quote, but it's really the idea of, you know, raising awareness looks like many different things, but it's really the job of people that know about these social issues to uh, help others that are not aware of them become aware of them and what's going on around them. And, and just like, you know, uh, just my own personal story, like I grew up in the city of Richmond in food judges and didn't know that that's what it was called or that's what I was dealing with, you know, and I think a lot of people uh, live in communities that have lack of access to healthy food and have never considered, you know, the lack of proximity to help to, 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 to uh, whether it be a grocery store or a green space and how that impacts them, right? It's our job as folks that are in this work to really help people understand the social conditions and give definition to what's happening around them so we can then develop solutions that are, uh, stewarded by community, right? And if community understands what the phenomenon that they're actually experiencing is, then they can iterate the decisions and iterate the solutions that will transform the community on, on their terms. Um, so yeah, that's, I, 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 I saw on the thing that I was supposed to go till 11.30. I could go a lot longer, but I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. I know we're at 11.05 and I'm thinking that maybe we got time for questions or something like that. Um, thank you, thank you so much, Duran. Um, your the trajectory of your work over almost twenty years is just extraordinary, and it's been so helpful to hear you speak of uh, the ground that you've covered, and also to see how these many different elements have come together on that corner of Broad and uh, Belvedere. Um, would you take a couple of questions? Is that yeah, I'm totally down for that. We can definitely, we definitely take a couple questions. Um, who would like to ask the first question? You can unmute and ask away. I will ask a question. I was typing it in the chat box, but I'll go ahead and just ask it. Um, I love what you've done with the uh, blacktop at the ICA, next to the ICA. This has been one of my um, pet peeves for years is the amount of, of paved space that at one time perhaps had an intent and is not really meeting that need anymore, yet it's still, still just sitting there. So there's spaces all over the city that could 
be used this way? Have you been making plans and looking at, at building more of these spaces? Yeah, so um, right now, uh, as you know, and this, this is also just kind of going back to just the finding this new normal, you know, by virtue of the work that we did through Beautiful RVA, I mean, we developed dozens of spaces all across the city in different communities, you know, collaborating with them and supporting them to develop these, and, and not only develop, but to sustain those spaces has been the, has been the work, you know? Um, so in light of no longer working for Lewis Gainer, we had to really, re we had to reconfigure how we were sustaining spaces, you know what I mean? Because we didn't have the access to the same type of funding that we had access to when we were at um, the Botanical Garden. Um, of course, I took my last check that I got from Lewis Ginner and, and turned Happily Natural Day into a nonprofit, right? So that meant that, you know, we're, you know, less than six months old, so we're raising funds in order to, you know, do that work. So right now, uh, there's about, you know, within the organization, we're, we're focusing on six spaces um, within the city that we can immediately, like, focus, that we can put all of our energy into and a seventh space that's coming online uh, uh, within the first quarter of 2021, um, we're starting uh, a community orchard on uh, Richmond's South Side called Sankofa Community Orchard. Um, but these vacant lots, um, the work that I do in collaboration with um, Groundworks uh, and, and, and even more resonantly with the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, our work uh, there not only is to address the need for affordable housing, but also the need for public green space. So the uh, community land trust will is, is taking pro uh, pr uh, property from the city or even from Chesterfield and Henrico. And if that space, those spaces aren't buildable in terms of uh, a home, or if it's a long kind of like runway for the development of a home on that space then that space becomes a candidate for us to do some greening on. And um, as those, re as the resources become available for us to do that, you know, we're all always available to make those moves. Um, but if our deeper focus is on building the community capacity. So we're still doing trainings, you know what I mean? Every, uh, since, since COVID ha has jumped off, we've done two uh, boot camps where we've trained about 16 people in how to do, you know, urban ag and, and urban uh, farming. And so, you know, we're still in this, in this, in this kind of like, you know, balancing, like trying to find our footing in light of COVID with the socially distanced stuff. Uh, I aspire to develop as many green spaces as I possibly, as we possibly can. Um, but given that, you know, we also got to keep in mind that people need to stay six feet apart. And we don't want to, you know, become super spreaders by virtue of trying to develop a garden. You know what I mean? We just kind of, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just one of those really precarious kind of things of being strategic uh, and how we move. Thank you. Um, another question? Anyone? There's some stuff popping up in the chat. Um, somebody says, um, where are we finding the conversation? Is, is the commentary on racial and food justice on Instagram is powerful. Where are you finding that conversation is taking us? Um, well, I'll say this. The work that we do is for me is this is personal work. Like my person, my, uh, somebody, there's a quote, somebody said that the personal is political. Uh, uh, who, whose quote is that? I don't know whose quote is that but I've heard it before. Um, so my personal is that, you know, I've grown up in the city of Richmond. I'm a native Richmonder. I'm from this city, right? I was raised on the South Side, you know, um, I grew up, I went to George Whiff, I went to Bouchard Middle School, you know what I mean? So I'm, 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 I'm embedded here. My children live in the region, you know, my family's here, my mom, my, my dad, everybody. So, um, Living in a city and being active in the community for me is uh, is an intimate thing, and so I'm always about um, the work of, of of connecting 
you know, my own personal narrative and being, you know, authentic about that and how that shapes my understanding and shapes, you know, our understanding of what's going on in this big macro world, right? Of, of food deserts and all this type of stuff. Like, it's one thing to quote all the stats. Like we know that Richmond is like 25% in poverty, but what does that mean really? Like people wise, like there's human beings that are living in this, in this scenario, but you know, we put it into numbers and stuff like that and we kind of lose the fact that these are, they're actual people. And so, um, you know, where that's taking me it's just taking us into, into deeper connection with people. Um, it's taking us into um, just really space, deep spaces of vulnerability, which I think is important for us to really connect uh, as humans, you know, in this work. It's not enough for us to just be like, you know, yeah, fight the power. Um, that's important and that's pivotal, but how do we fight the power beyond our, community connection and our coming together and being able to see each other as, you know, uh, real people, not just online personas. Like this is, you know, this is people's lives. So um, yeah, it's taken us into a, a lot of different places. I mean, we've always been very honest about what's been going on. I know I, I probably lost uh, supporters because of, you know, just being honest about my lived experience in this work, you know, whether it be uh, talk, talking about my experience working at Lewis Ginner or dealing with other nonprofits, you know, this is this is just the nature of what it is. It's, you know, just trying to keep it real and be a hundred percent authentic with myself and honest about my own mistakes, but also just being real about just effed up stuff that's been going on in the social system. You know what I mean? Um, Thanks. There are some really interesting questions that have come up in chat. Wow. And, um, one from Megan, is it Goff? Do you see yeah. that we're on? Yeah. Um, Do you continue to support your work as a pub public university with a responsibility to serve the public good? Yeah, so um, thank you, Megan. Um, so we, as, as, as we've done this work, you know, different elements of VCU um, has shown up and different capacities and you know the wilder school definitely has been an amazing collaborator um, in terms of you know uh, supporting our work and helping us refine uh what we what we've been doing and you know the urban planning students have always approached this work with really deep passion and this and, and that's the type of energy uh that we've always i've always been very receptive to and i think um just continuing to grow that type of collaboration finding students that are uh, imagining new ways for our world to work, you know, uh, connecting them to the practice that we've actually put in, that we've been putting into place uh, is, 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 I think, a great place, a great starting point. Um, the work that we did with, with the ICA is fascinating stuff. I mean, this is a, you know, a, a public facing art museum that has taken a very, uh, intentional step towards being community engaged. And it, and while, you know, um, there's a certain place of privilege that you, you, you have to access in order to like, you know, connect with a museum of art, you know what I mean? Uh, there's the, 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 the doorway that they've opened up um, creates a unique kind of set of conditions for uh, community to be able to uh, uh, engage these ideas uh, in ways that can be really beneficial. I mean, for example, like this, this the, the fact that we had this garden at that space, um, you know, those, those ideas, I think, might not have been uh, real for folks. Um, you know, people might have heard of food deserts or heard of climate inequity or urban heat island effect or stuff like that. But, in, but when they get into the space and they see that there's things that we can actually do at the corner of Broad and Belvedere, I think that's a different type of uh, uh, relationship. That door has been opened by virtue of VCU and the Art Museum at the corner. Um, and so I think that the university can definitely take steps to continue to invest in those type of collaborations with community people. Um, and when I say community people, I mean like really finding organizations that are on the ground that are doing work 
and finding out ways that the resources that they have access to can be marshaled and connected to the work that those folks in the community are actually doing and really like not just being kind of like a transactional thing, but really developing deep relationships. And 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 that and that deep relationship, you know, evolving over time and you know, refining and you know, us assessing and revamping and coming back together and you know, evolving the thing that we're doing, the things that we're doing so that we can really have impact and do stuff that's dope and fun, you know what I mean? And and and, and exciting. I mean, for me, that that's uh, the, the resiliency garden piece was, was exciting for me, you know, as a, as an activist in the city to be able to, you know, tell people, hey, you know, go by Broad and Belvedere and you can see an example, see some examples of what you can do in your own community. Like that's, you know, placemaking for me, it's a, it's a really a, amazing example. So, yeah, I think that, you know, it, it, there's some, there's some work that can be done, you know, um, of course, VCU still got a lot of bureaucracy, and you know it has some internal kind of issues as a as a as a as an institution in terms of how it's dealt with, you know, pre-existing community. Uh, I mean, just in terms of just even at the space itself, you know, we had to be, you know, this it, the actual land is owned by VCU real estate, which you know that was a unique kind of engagement, like dealing with VCU real estate. When we were invited to do the garden by the ICA, it was just a lot of different entities to engage with. And then, like, they're like, "Yeah, you need to sign this and do this." These are the people at VCU Real Estate. We were just trying to give away some tree seedlings, and it was like fifty million emails back and forth on how we do that. And it was like, "Yo, it's just we're just gonna give away some seedlings." Like, so you know, sometimes that big monstrosity of an organization can be uh, clumsy and, 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 and can stifle very easy things that could be very simple. Um, but I think the, the intimate relationships with departments is what, uh, you know, individual departments, individual professors, classes, you know, is what really makes stuff uh, pop. And then when, you know, those resources, financial resources like grants and stuff like that can be connected to community, that's when it really can hit a sweet spot. Um, thank you, Duran. Um, there are a number of questions here that have to do with volunteer possibilities. Sure. Um, uh, Audrey Short is asking, are there COVID safe volunteer opportunities? Kate? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm just be candid. Um, I've been super uh, hesitant to really like turn up volunteerism. The way we did the uh, resiliency garden uh, volunteerism is like your pod could go out, pick up wood, pick up bags of soil, and then go drop that off at somebody's house. Or you could build the box at somebody's house. So that required no, you know, physical person to person engagement outside of the people that were in your pod. Like you and the people that are in your house like y'all can go out and go do a thing. Um, you can start growing some seedlings, you know, then you can go take those seedlings and drop them off on somebody's porch. Real easy stuff. But in the fall and winter, you know, we decided to kind of scale back on the resiliency garden giveaway because it was really, um, it's a lot of work, you know, to be honest. Um, giving away that many, that, that many raised beds required us to uh, cut wood. I mean, just imagine like, you know, 12 foot planks that need to be cut into four foot lengths and six foot lengths, you know, somebody had to do that. <laughs> so that, so we said, all right, we just gonna chill until spring on that. Um, but in the same time, we got other spaces that we've been dealing with. So um, the, our community garden work has been a space where folks have been able to volunteer consistently, like every week at, for example, Bra Rock Community Garden, there's socially distanced volunteer opportunities where people can help pick up trash and plant and maintain some of the raised beds. Um, our farm work has been a space where I've been really way more uh, precautious than maybe is necessary. But um, after I caught COVID, 
it, it all came to fruition that yeah, we definitely needed to be mindful about how how many volunteers were calling out to come support the work and how often we were doing that. So what we've done is we came up with this um, schedule. Uh, matter of fact, today, um, uh, eight volunteers uh, uh, at, at Farm and Family, uh, which is a space that we uh, farm at most, most regularly, um, socially distanced uh, work at, you know, if you don't have a mask, you'll be given a mask. If you don't have gloves, you'll be given gloves. You know, that type of, we had to put into a, we had to put a protocol in place to facilitate people at the farm because that's where, you know, it is a lot more closer in the actions typically because, you know, there's people showing up that don't really know how to do this stuff. Uh, but we've come up with some techniques to, to kind of like keep everybody safe and keep people you know, six feet apart and, you know, uh, and, and, and developing the space so that we can keep all that energy rolling. So yes, there are volunteer opportunities. It just depends also uh, on what folks level of uh, skill is. Uh, so, you know, definitely go check out the website, the naturalfestival.com or any of our social media, you go to mine, you know, it has links to all the different gardens and stuff like that, that we are participating in. And more often than not, it's probably going to be a community garden space that you can volunteer at. Um, but as we get into the first quarter of 2021, we're going to be digging deeper into how we launch volunteerism at our farm. So stay tuned. Um, we, we're trying to figure this stuff out um, just as much as everybody else. But it's uh, the, the, the lessons that I've learned is keep it small, you know, no more than eight people at a time. You know, we have three fourths of an acre that we're farming on. So, you know, that's enough for people to spread out, you know what I'm saying, and stay safe. I mean, I caught COVID, it's no joke, it's, it's, it's real. Like, um, I wouldn't wish that experience on anybody. So I'm really trying to keep everybody that engages in our work safe. Um, there are on a couple of people are asking about resources and additional information and materials on um, starting a green space. Um, Ricky uh, mentions that he's working on doing this on an industrial lot in Manchester and you know he's looking for more specific um, instructions and information about treating soil that is toxic. Is there um, among all the information and um, experiences you have amassed at this point, is there one uh, central website that we can go to to look further into this? So, uh, right, no, to, to be honest, no, there isn't, there's, there's like, it depends on what you're looking for. And in this, in the, in the case of like resources to do green spaces, um, beautiful RVA is a great space. Beautifulrva.org is a great space to go to for like hyper local stuff. But, uh, and there's like, if you go on that website, there's like uh, toolkits, there's uh, literature reviews. Um, so that's a great space to start. But uh, when you get down to like brownfield remediation, there's a very kind of like, specific you know topic and and, and and to be candid um you know the epa is the best place to go they have the epa has several guides on their website about brownfield remediation now i will say this you know it gets expensive like brown like really to really remediate toxic toxic soil it, it takes time and money but the work that we do is kind of like we work around it. And so, uh, you know, you can go to my website, uh, deronshavers.com or uh, thenaturalfestival.com and kind of like search raised beds. We always do raised beds on uh, uh, city property because city property typically has lead, arsenic, mercury, cadmium. Some level of heavy metals have been uh, 
leached into the soil over time. So, um, you know, what we end up doing on majority, if not all of the spaces that we develop is we put an entirely, entire, we like capped off the space. So geotextile fabric, um, uh, deep mulch of uh, 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 double shredded uh, bark, you know, um, straw, cardboard, and try to lift the ground of the actual garden space at least six inches above its original grade, right? So whatever heavy metals might have existed in that space are is now beneath six to eight inches mm -hmm. of organic material with some sort of sheeting in between that uh, space and then raised beds on top of that organic material, which we always recommend like at least 10 to 12 inches high in terms of raised beds, which will have you know, 10, 10 to 12 inches of soil, compost topsoil inside of it that you're actually growing it. So now, so now you're looking at at least 20 inches above where the heavy metals might be, right? And that's- well, Interesting. That's um, I, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that is I, interesting. And thank you for that. Um, what about introducing worms? And it's, when, when you have a cap like that, what are you doing about that? So, 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 so the, the thing is, is that um, the worms uh, are gonna come, uh, but I've never had it. We never had any issues with, with the worms coming. Um, so when you cap off the space, so what, what you're doing is you're actually, lay, you're actually layering more organic matter on top of the, mm -hmm. uh, the fabric or whatever. So, so what happens is that you know, you're not actually, the thing you're trying to avoid is growing inside of the soil that has the heavy metal. Yeah. That's, that's your op, that's, that's, that's what you're trying to accomplish. <laughs> so by putting this new layer of, of organic matter in this raised bed on top of that organic matter, you kind of, you just dodge the whole situation. So yeah, you know, there's, there's websites that, that can kind of show you that. And then if you go to my website, there's a couple of kits to show you how to do it. But at the end of the day, your, your, your main focus is, okay, how can I not grow food inside of the soil that has heavy metals? Like, well, how can it I avoid is, it? Yeah, no, you're right. I, I was just trying to take it one step further and make the soil healthy again. But Yeah, um, and you can do that. And you can do that, definitely. You know, you can do that. You know, folks are doing mycology, people planting mushrooms, and people are also doing... Um, uh, uh, sunflowers and brassicas. And then they, and alfalfa. Yeah. Yeah. Phyto remediation. It's interesting. I was just wondering if you guys, uh, this part of your process, but. Uh, no, nah, we don't have enough money to do that and time. You <laughs> 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 keep it on that one. And I don't have enough time nor enough money to, 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 to do uh, micro remediation on space. If I, if I get a grant to do that, then yeah. But until I'm not, that's not, this is outside of my my scope because you know people hungry it. right now not five years from now you know what i'm saying yeah. <laughs> so. uh, just, just to mention this note you. from john jones and he says that the virginia state tech extension will have great resources about all of this mm -hmm. and also a suggestion from liz cerny there's an excellent book by activist leah Pinneman called farming while black that offers a lot of practical farming tips as well as ideas how to engage with the, you know, with the food justice movement. Um, any comment on uh, on that book, Duran? Have oh yeah, that's my sister. I love it. We had her come down to the city um, last year. Uh, she came down and um, did a did, did a talk with us, um, and she's one of my comrades. In fact, um, the work that. Uh, she's done in uh, New upstate New York, uh, helping inspire the resiliency garden work. They actually um, were giving away raised beds um, in um, New York City. And so we were like, yo, we could do that too. So uh, yeah, big shout out to Leah and um, her work. We're actually featured on her reparations map, uh, So Far Farms reparations map uh, for the work that we're doing here in the city. So, you know, Definitely big, big, big thanks to, to, to the connecting of the dots that she's uh, 
uh, blessed us with through, through uh, Farmer Wabat. Another book that's amazing though is Freedom Farmers um, by Monica White. Um, and then there's another book called Land Justice. Um, it's put, I think it's put out there by um, uh, Eric Holt Jimenez. I, th I think that's his name, but I'm, I might be messing it up. But there's a, there's a, those three books, Land Justice, uh, Freedom Farmers, and Farming While Black have really helped inform a lot of the, the, the theory behind the work that we're doing, um, particularly around the Black Space Matters idea uh, or, or the, the, the vision behind that is that we need land to really do this work. We need access to land. And it's always been a challenge. One of the greatest challenges of doing this work has been land tenure and land access, particularly in an urban environment, because you know we, we're we're up against folks that are trying to develop for commercial purposes, real estate developers that are looking to gentrify communities. You know, these these realities, these afford, need, the need for affordable housing, all of these pressures, kind of eke out urban ag to, you know, to the back burn, right? But at the same time, you know, um, that doesn't stop the need for space to have for, for, for public green space for, for urban farms and et cetera. Um, so, and then the, the, the double whammy is that as communities of color, we don't have the capital to go out and purchase land in the city. You know, often it's a challenge. So working uh, with community land trusts like Maggie Walker, community land trust, you know, we've been uh, figuring out methods to develop public commons, public agrarian commons, where the land is owned by the community land trust, but community members can farm that land to, for food justice purposes, right? And for economic and social development purposes. Um, but all of those different books uh, land justice in particular, but then also Freedom Farmers articulates the narratives of different organizations that have been doing the same thing for over 50 years, right? Um, you know, particularly like New Communities Incorporated, Shirley Sherrod, um, it's highlighted in both uh, Land Justice as well as um, Freedom Farmers and uh, Leah talks about it in um, Farming While Black. And so that's the type of thing that we're looking to activate here in Richmond is this really intentional focus on uh, uh, land uh, redistribution and uh, connecting communities to explicitly to not only land to farm on, but also land to do commercial uh, endeavors uh, that would allow for that farming to be successful. It's not just about the farming and growing of the food, it's also about the distribution, the aggregation, you know what I mean, the value adding, all of that stuff is pertinent and, and, and the uber importance if we're gonna really have a robust and resilient food system. A lot of us and in, in a lot of the work that's done around urban ag in the city of Richmond is focused specifically around growing food, which is insufficient. I mean, it's great. And it does kind of, it's, it's like the beginning. It's like the, it's like the beginning stages. But if we really wanna uh, create definitive impact, then it takes collaboration to develop systems that allow for supply chains to be developed, for people to be able to be employed, for people to uh, be able to um, iterate ownership and not be in this in unstable kind of space where somebody can come and say, hey, yeah, it's great that you have been growing this food over here, but there's a developer that wants to put um, some apartments here, so you, you gotta go. Um, you know, what you've just said relates to Matthew Slats's uh, question and comment. I don't know if you all are following the chat function, but there's still lots of great questions here. But uh, Matthew says, you have me thinking about another Southern Black organizer, Salad Muhammad, who talks about the need for infrastructure to support Black labor and power. Yeah. How do you imagine and think about the meaning of the infrastructures you have been creating for Black RVA? Um, you know, for me, I, I feel like I haven't done enough. I feel like we've got so much more to go, so much so much further to go. Um, I'll be honest with you, man, we've developed spaces all up and down, you know, from Petersburg to, uh, to Richmond. Uh, and, you know, we've been able 
to to really have some amazing spaces that have come alive uh, for uh, climate, environmental, social cohesion. But to be candid, like the work that we've done that could connect to economic development has always been stifled by this land tenure, this this, this land tenure issue, right? Uh, while it takes it takes up to three, at least three to five years to really get a uh, urban farm productive, right? Because you're dealing with uh, putting in the infrastructure, getting the soil right, you know, possibly you putting some high tunnels on it, you know what I mean? Making sure that you've got the water and then you have a system and you have, you know, a, 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 a supply system, whether it's a CSA distribution or farmer's market or whatever, or a membership program. Um, and almost every site that we've de developed that was right almost there, some happened where the folks that own the land decided to go in a different direction. So, you know, I always felt kind of like, uh, this is my Rubik's cube, is trying to figure out how to uh, get ownership or community ownership of land uh, for, because it's like, this is, the, this is the reality. I don't have the capital to go out and buy three acres of land in the city. I mean, I might be able to get that in in a in, in a rural space, but I don't live in a rural space. I live in on North Avenue, and so me going from North Avenue to Goochland every day to farm, it just that does it, it it doesn't work like that. You know what I mean? I don't have the capacity to do that. You know what I'm saying? And I don't think people that are in the urban environment that live in the city have the capacity to do that. It's just a certain space of privilege that you have to have to be able to drive an hour to farm for four hours a day. You know what I mean? Um, so the reality is like, I, have, I haven't abandoned the city in terms of farming. I feel like that the city has the capacity to do it. There's, you know, uh, a, a map on beautiful RBA that shows all of the vacant lots that exist that have been blighted. So, you know, that's, that's, the, that's the real work for me is really trying to, to, to lock down spaces. Now, the city's gardening program has been one of the most robust opportunities for us to really uh, develop the type of land tenure that's necessary for the stuff to be successful. Um, but we've had precautions even dealing with the city because there's some policies that need to be updated in order for people to really dig in and, uh, <laughs> pardon the pun, to really you know make some of this stuff work. Uh, and you know, it's only recently that we've been able to kind of get that runway clear so that we can shift the policies, particularly around commercial urban ag, um, uh, that will allow for folks to really do some, do some of the innovative things that need to happen. I mean, what we did in Petersburg with the Harding Street uh, Urban Ag Center, that is probably one of my most, uh, uh, I'm most proud of that work. I mean, literally, we transformed, we took a YMCA that was vacant and put an indoor farm on the inside and over 25,000 watts worth of solar on the roof, a commercial kitchen in the back, cold storage in the back, dock doors on the side, urban orchard down the street, urban farm across the street. Like, we literally transformed this neighborhood around urban agriculture. But we were able to do that because we had $915,000 to NIFA for three years, you know what I mean? So it's like, how do we, it's always this kind of dance of how do we marry the real resources that are needed to be invested in communities of color in order for this type of stuff to work. At the same time, how do we have the land tenure, you know what I mean, that 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 makes sense for that investment. It's like, I ain't gonna take $900,000 and I don't have ownership of the land. <laughs> Put $900,000 on a property that you just got an agreement for three years Boy, you you asking for some disappointment because <laughs> what happened is after three years and you made all these improvements, the people that own the land like, oh, hey, thanks, man, that was amazing, and uh, uh, see you later. We're, we're gonna go in a different direction. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's that's the equity kind of conversation too. But um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's it, the the best is I'll say this: the best is yet to come. The best is yet. To
Well, it sure would be uh, great now that um, VCU has seen what you've done on the corner with the resiliency garden, if somehow they could continue to support your work. Um, it seems as though that would be so pertinent to many departments uh, within the university and certainly the VCU Real Estate Foundation, it would be great if they would step, step up as well. Yeah, so uh, incredibly that's happy. actually the aspiration. You know, it, thank you for saying that because, you know, if anybody from the VCU hierarchy is, going, is watching this, yes, we do, we would much, we would very much like to continue to develop uh, vacant parcels of property that are within the VCU portfolio for urban ag and public green space purposes. I think that, uh, the, the alignment of food justice and climate justice uh, will be perfect kind of narratives for VCU in terms of how it engages community and developing space and using, you know, underutilized resources uh, for community benefit. And what my hope secretly is that somebody will say, hey, nobody parks in this parking lot, <laughs> even, you know, on a regular day, you know what I mean? Like that. Uh, so maybe the resiliency garden uh, can stay. Uh, that would be amazing too. But um, we're 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 ready to make it do what it needs to do either way. That would be awesome. And and while while we're talking about support, I know you've just initiated a fundraising campaign. And would you please tell us how we can contribute? Yeah. So um, we do. Okay, we're doing um, Giving Tuesday. So. You know, well, all right, what's actually going on is that we're raising funds for the San Copa Community Orchard. Um, our, our, our next effort is a one acre uh, community orchard on Southside next to Reedy Creek off of Melothian Turnpike. This is a city uh, space. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's gonna be over 80 fruit trees um, we aspire to do uh, apples, peaches, pears, plums, persimmons, uh, apricots. But the, the defining kind of thing that we're looking to do on this space is to, is to uh, uh, install uh, retrofitted shipping containers as community spaces, right? So you can actually, that, like, it's, like, instead of us buying a shed, and using the shed as a space for gathering and connecting, like we actually use these shipping containers as spaces that people can engage and use for uh, uh, art purposes, but also as storage for uh, for tools and et cetera. So um, work that, that's really the, the kind of bigger vision for the space. Uh, and we're looking to start working on that um, in spring of uh, 2021. Um, so we got some funds that we've already raised, but we're trying to, you know, boost the amount that we have access to so that we can really do this space right. Um, it'll be the largest um, or one of the largest uh, Black-led community spaces um, in the city once we, uh, once we get, get it going. So um, look forward to keeping it going. Duran, I know that um, there was a posting on Facebook about um, fundraising with a link, where else can people find that link? So um, if, if folks would like to support the work that we're doing, um, they can go to uh, the natural festival.com. Uh, um, we have links. Um, when you go on that page, you can actually specify, hey, I want to donate to build a rate for, uh, to, for someone to get a raised bed. I want to donate to have a tree planted. I want to donate, you know, just $25 to, you know, keep y'all going. You can go to the website and they kind of specify um, how you would like to make a contribution. Um, and I, you know, you can also go through Facebook, which is great, you know, um, go to the uh, natural festival on uh, Happy Natural Day on, um, on Facebook, which, you know, um, that those direct uh, donations get to us quicker. We are usually, uh, I think we, we raised in the spring, almost uh, $90,000 for the resiliency garden work, uh, which is fast and was amazing, but it took us a little while to get the money. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's all good, however, however it comes. Um, and like I said, there's, we're a new nonprofit. So, you know, 
it's kind of like this stuff is like our startup funding to get you know these spaces in shape and get all the tools and equipment that we need in order to make this work work um your, your any contributions folks are making are totally tax deductible um and and, and it's, it's going to actually getting our work sustainable uh, thank you for those details and thank you Doron. i mean this conversation could go on for another another couple of hours at least um but this hour and 15 minutes has been so informative. We really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. Your well, I appreciate y'all, man. This is great. I appreciate the Q&A more than I think I, the uh, the, actual, <laughs> <laughs> the actual presentation, because this is where we can really get into the nitty gritty. Well, we appreciate both equally. <laughs> thank you. And um, just before we all sign off, I'm going to turn this back over to Kelly to just um, inform you about the next programs that are coming up. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Duran. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. This has been one of the most wonderful conversations we've had, and I think that's really what we're all missing right now is, is conversation. So I hope you will uh, let me know what you thought about this event and also any ideas you might have for others. You know, VCU libraries, we are as vast as the university itself, so we can do an event on practically anything. Let me know what you would like to see. Um, these events are made possible by our friends of VCU Libraries, and I just dropped in the chat the link to show you the information about our friends in case you would like to learn more. Um, I do hope that you'll plan to join us on Thursday, December 17th. That's our next community Zoom event at 1030 a.m. It'll be our holiday edition of What's Everyone Reading? Uh, this session will be led by Nick Cook, who is the owner of Black Swan Books. You can simply join the, join the session using the link that you use today. We keep them the same every week. Um, we'll give you bonus points if you wear your tacky holiday sweater. Um, I promise that you will come away with a great list of reading suggestions from um, your fellow attendees. So again, thank you so much for being here today. And please let us know what you would like to see. We would love to uh, program to meet your needs. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank, Thank you, you all. Stay safe. Bye-bye.